Okay. Hi there, everybody. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Susanne Flack. Um, she is a postdoctoral research fellow of English Linguistics at the University of Neuchâtel in Switzerland. In early 2017, she received her PhD at the Freie Universität Berlin uh, for usage-based analysis of constraints on English serial verb constructions. Her primary research interests focus on the analysis of lexical grammatical patterns in English and the way in which this contributes to our understanding, our understanding of human language. Most generally, she focuses on the interaction of lexis and syntax from a usage-based quantitative perspective. Uh, we are now looking forward to her talk, Using Association Plots to Investigate Language Change, Distributional Shifts in the Interpositive. And I would like you to please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Susanne Flack. Uh, thanks, I haven't said anything, so uh, let me earn. Um, the appreciation. Okay, thank you very much for the nice introduction and thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited. I've never been to Osnabrück before and uh, considering it's the center in the Osnabrücker Land, I um, <laughs> think um, I should give it a try. Okay, so um, a bit of housekeeping. I'm recording this talk, uh, so if technology doesn't fail me, I will upload it to YouTube if you want to go back, but you're free to take notes or um, pictures. Uh, but again, you can uh, go back and rewatch uh, parts of that. Um, second part, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me at any time. Uh, because we are going through a bit of material. Uh, so there'll be three blocks um, about a relatively rare construction, but that can be used to illustrate um, some very general principles, uh, not only of language description or language change, but also about linguistic theory. So I will come back to that um, towards the end of the point. So basically, this is a case study that should walk us through um, an, an example, a construction, an English language uh, phenomenon in its entirety um, from its early inception to uh, today. <clears throat> okay, so what's the plan for the next maybe three quarters of an hour to an hour, depending on your questions, is I'll introduce you to the intercausative. What is it? Okay, some synchronic properties. And then we look at the diachronic origin because the construction is actually interesting that we can almost point to um, a, a point in time where um, this construction emerged from uh, related constructions. And then I'll talk about the data that I'm using for the recent development. Uh, because one thing that uh, we can say at this point already is that over the last 200 years that construction increased um, fivefold in frequency. So that's um, something that's really interesting, right, raising, giving rise to the question, um, why is that the case? Can we say anything about uh, what contributed to this um, increase? And then I'll go into the association plots, um, which is a relatively complex way of visualizing data. But it's also very intuitive. So once you know how to interpret these association plots, they actually give um, a lot of information at the same time that other types of visualization um, strategies would not uh, give you. Um, we'll do that into uh, case studies. So we'll look at shifts in verb classes, so which verbs actually occur in the intercausative. And then we look at something, um, how do these verbs behave uh, in terms of their argument structure profiles. And then we go back and sort of link that back to um, the theory, which is known as construction grammar, um, and I'll give a few um, introductory words on them um, as well. Okay, what's the um, intercausative? Um, one example here, can you read that? Is It's, okay, okay, fine. Um, who was that one who talked us into taking this uh, limo? So we talk about this um, structure, uh, which um, is structurally consists of a subject, um, who, a verb, talk, object, us, and intertaking. That's um, what we call an oblique. It's something that is required in this construction, um, which in this case is a prepositional phrase. So into plus a verb in the um, ink form. A second example would be, Dr. Wilson, the reliably great Robert Chen Leonard, tries to blackmail the staffless house into hiring a new team by kidnapping his beloved 
guitar. So now we ha can make a generalization. What does the construction mean? Okay, so once we have this form, um, what type of meaning do we have? So we have a causer, Dr. Wilson, who acts on a causee, Dr. House, um, by means of blackmailing, such that Dr. House carries out an action, hiring a new team. Okay, another example would be uh, the Bush campaign frightened the American people into believing that the threat of terrorism would increase if Bush were defeated. Same principle, you have a cause or a causer, in this um, case the Bush campaign, um, who acts on the American people and they frighten um, the American people such that the American people think or believe um, that terrorism will increase if you don't elect um, uh, Bush. Here is will duped or will be duped or deceived into believing falsehood, same principle. Um, and finally, <clears throat> excuse me, finally, I will not struxify gullible people into looking up fictitious words in the dictionary. There's no use Googling that, it is a made up word. Okay? Been there, done that. So um, whenever you uh, look up Spotify or Google that, um, it will always occur in this particular uh, context. It comes from a a uh, news group internet uh, mailing forum from the uh, late 90s. Okay, so now we have a, a generalization basically. Uh, we have a form that is paired with, uh, with a meaning. Um, and if you look closely at the verbs that occur in this construction, uh, such as talk, like talk somebody into doing something, that's a very odd use of the verb talk. Okay, talk is not normally a verb that takes um, animate direct objects. So something to you can't talk somebody. It's almost as if you talk somebody, you think like yeah into doing something. Okay, so outside this construction, um, talk does not occur with animate um, objects. You can have inanimate objects. So let's talk business. Okay, that's fine. But um, the talk somebody that's actually a really a relatively um, strange use of the verb. Another aspect, and we come back to that in a second, is that all the other verbs, they're also not very, like their meaning doesn't include usually uh, an element of causation. So if you were trying to explain uh, what does blackmail mean, you would usually not include um, a definition that includes uh, causation, that you call someone else to do something. There's an implied effect, but that's something um, very strange, that you have all these verbs and not actually causative verbs. So a typical causative verb would be to cause. Duh. But cause doesn't actually occur in the intercausative. So that's something pretty strange, yet we have this meaning of um, causation. How do we account for these facts? Um, that's your um, introduction to construction grammar, and I love construction grammar because it fits on a quarter of a slide. Um, because what we assume is that um, you have a, a meaning that is paired with um, uh, a, a form, okay? So these kind of map onto each other. Um, and in this case, we have cause, basically the verb specifies the manner of how this causation is um, brought about. Then we draw some boxes and we give that um, a, a name, the intercausative, and we say, well, basically the meaning of this structural pattern is X causes Y to do Z by means of verb. Interestingly, um, as a wrap up, uh, this pattern itself, okay, regardless of what you put into this pattern, such as uh, Sproxify, it will always have this meaning of, of causation. So that must have been contributed by the construction because none of these verbs are inherently um, causative. Okay, so there's a bit of a job sharing um, or division of labor between uh, the verbs that occur in the construction and the structural pattern um, itself. So let's just call that um, this pattern is a bit of a cue uh, for causative meaning. Now, You'd, believe, you'd think like, okay, well, if these verbs are not causative, what constrains the use of these verbs? Okay, it's quite productive, quite innovative. There's lots of uh, different verbs. Um, 
and you have like a, a high ratio of um, verbs that only occur once in the construction and then some more typical verbs. So uh, talk is, a, is the most frequent verb in that construction, whereas the others are, tend to be a bit rarer. Um, and then you have a high number of what we call hapax uh, legomena, which are only, verbs that only occur once, either in the construction um, or in the corpus. But if you look closely, there's actually a bit of a pattern um, behind um, how, which verbs occur in that construction. So in the first um, case we had talked, um, we could put that into the category of um, communication or persuasion verbs, and other examples would include wheedle, coax, charm, persuade, argue, humor, chit-chat, flatter. Same principle again, um, I'm chit-chatting doesn't usually take objects, animate or inanimate, um, or I'm chit-chatting to somebody, okay, so you'd have like a prepositional um, um, argument there. Another group, um, blackmail, uh, belongs to a group we might call force or pressure verbs. Other example of force, coerce, torture, brainwash, beat, bush, pressure. Um, it's actually a very violent construction. So if you go through all the examples, you think like, oh yeah, okay, and then you try to find examples that are, should I say politically correct? It's very difficult uh, because you're acting, it's a causation construction, okay? It's a causation between two people. So it's really difficult to find um, um, less violent um, examples. Um, third class is the uh, frightened class or trickery or deception. Okay, it includes bully, shame, shock, intimidate, tease, guilt, scare. So anything that creates unpleasant feelings, negative emotions. Fourth, dupe or deceive. We have them both in, in, in one example here. Um, <clears throat> these are also verbs of, of betrayal, um, uh, trickery, include trick, fool, con, betray, hypnotize, mislead. Okay, so anywhere where you we sort of, you know, lead people down the wrong um, track. And the last group, um, it's always a way out. If you can't find a name for that group, you call it a bin category. Um, in this case, we call them uh, miscellaneous or other. Uh, verbs such as proxify, but um, some of the more frequent ones include um, stimulate, for instance, um, or trigger. Now that's interesting because they are verbs that initiate something. Like the other verbs usually don't focus on the initiation of an event, but stimulate and trigger are um, initiation verbs. Um, you have a bit of a some motion verbs: guide, lead, or steer. Okay, sort of steering along a path. Or steering someone into uh, an action. We'll come back to that in a minute. And finally, then you have examples like calm and rationalize. They're usually um, single verbs. They only occur once in the construction. So this group down here accounts for only 10% of the data, um, but they have many different verbs um, in them. Okay? But the, the crucial point is they don't fit into, into these other categories um, of communication, force, uh, fear, or trick verbs. And um, <clears throat> so now one question that we could ask, how did this develop over time? So we'll come back to that um, at various points as well. So here is um, your synchronic um, overview of the construction. Right? It's um, some typical argument structure construction. It's very creative, allows a lot of different verbs. It's very tolerant towards verbs that usually do not occur with animate objects or with any kind of um, arguments um, at all. And um, yeah, so that's where you go into um, the history. Where does the construction actually um, come from? If you look at a large corpus, and that was a lot of dirty work, I had to go through a lot of examples to actually find uh, what I believe are the earliest um, examples. So you go back to the 17th um, century, he was honestly trepanned into giving sentence against himself. So he, by some external force, um, ended up giving sentence about himself. And a similar example from uh, around the same period, besides you hacked at me into saying I love both. Now, these are the earliest uh, examples that I could find. If the corpus was a bit larger, maybe you'd find some uh, yet earlier examples, but that's um, sort of a different um, story. Where does it come from? Now, it's 
related um, semantically to your plain vanilla coarse motion construction. What's a coarse motion construction? Um, you have X and Y, the king, X and Y, the army, and the king moves the army into France, saying um, X causes Y to move Z. Now, in this case, uh, the army is moving into a location. That construction has been attested uh, since um, a long time, basically. What then happens in the um, 16th century, more or less, is the rise of um, the into argument with ing forms. Okay, so that's a relatively recent um, development. It turned uh, mirth into mourning. They cast us into trembling and fear. But what what is um, important is that these are not verbal, they're actually more nominal. And you see that most clearly in these coordinated um, uh, structures, so trembling and fear. You usually coordinate things that are of the same class, so these must be uh, nouns. Um, the principle is the same, X causes Y to move into a state of being, so into mourning or into trembling and fear, sort of a metaphorical um, motion towards or into the container there. Now, what then happens in the um, uh, early, well, late 16th, early 17th century is um, the rise, rise of examples such as they orders into truth uh, speaking, where we're not really sure whether that is nominal or verbal, so it's ambiguous between um, the two readings. Uh, clearly, however, now we don't have movement into a location or a state of being, but we have movement into a state of action. Okay, because truth speaking implies that there is some act on the part of um, the causey. And that is the important part. It, you, you would think if the causey is responsible for the action that is um, encoded in the ing form, then once you have that, made that observation, um, you could actually move on to um, having these examples where clearly um, the patient, he or me are responsible, sort of like that's what we call a, um, a sentential uh, complement. Okay, so up here, this is just more or less a noun phrase, uh, sorry, in a prepositional um, phrase with a noun phrase, whereas here you have um, a prepositional phrase that is itself more or less a sentence. You can rephrase them, say like he gave sentence against himself, or, the, or I said I love both. Okay, so that's um, the, the general development. Okay, fast forward about a century because um, after the late 17th century, we don't have enough data. So this, all these examples here uh, come from a corpus that is so huge compared to many of the other corpora that we have for the um, uh, 18th century. Um, it's actually pretty rare. But you do find examples that sound exactly like the modern um, construction. And then you have uh, charged me with bullocking you into owning the truth. Okay, force verb. The house was large and elegant and betrayed me into furnishing it rather better than suited my present circumstances. Trick verb. I wish I could tease her into loving me a little. Fear, okay, creating unpleasant uh, feeling. You're teasing someone, unpleasant feeling. Okay, then will she love me? The civilities flattered her into believing she had excited a partiality that a very time would ripen into affection. There's a lot of love stories uh, around that time. Um, you have communication verbs. And led him into speaking of his own uh, plays. That's sort of your bin category. It's a bit of a motion verb uh, there. Okay, so we have from the earliest um, attestations throughout history um, all these verb classes are attested, and what's odd about these examples is not part of the construction. Um, that seems to be more in either because some of the verbs became less frequent or um, uh, left the language, sort of uh, fell out of use, or because the surrounding context is a bit odd or old-fashioned. But the construction itself doesn't actually change. You still have that structure. Um, there is no morphological change that much. Uh, the, it's um, it's um, a, what we call an object control uh, structure, meaning that the object of the 
uh, first part in the sentence is the understood subject of the second part, so there's no, there's very little change. However, as we saw before, um, it increases fivefold in frequency over the next uh, 300 years, and that's pretty amazing. Okay, what happened? Um, can we find anything structurally um, in the data? Okay, how do I go about? Um, if you're not familiar too much with corpus linguistic um, methods, I walk you through step by step of how I went about. I use the corpus of historical American English, uh, which is 400 million words spanning two centuries, and it contains material from fiction, magazine, uh, news, and uh, nonfiction. If you want to have a bit of a feeling of how much 400 million words is, picture 600 Bibles about. Okay, so that's about the textual material that we, we're talking about. So the Bible's really thin paper, and very like tiny written uh, print. Uh, so that's roughly the, the size of, of that corpus. And I queried it in a very broad um, query. So I looked for any verb, followed by a, any number of intervening material to cover long objects, such as the president's wife, and so on followed by into, and followed by any string that ends in ing. And I restricted that to one sentence, just so not to get as like overly large um, uh, queries. Um, that's more or less what then what my result uh, list would look like. And um, we already see that, um, because this is so broad and very inclusive, there are a lot of examples that wouldn't fit. So the first one, I'm read them out for you. I'm going to read them out because they're actually very small. Uh, so the first example is something and wouldn't be prom uh, compromised into being. Okay, that's an existence rather than an action sense, so I excluded that. <coughs> we often use choices to coerce our kids into doing. Yep, that's an example. He was being terrorized into making a statement. Yep. I turned you into something. Nominal. No. The University of Virginia came into being. Again, that's the existence sense. I excluded that as well. Um, he throws, well, whatever he throws into everything. Again, nominal, exclude that. And so on and so forth. Okay, so but once you go through that list, um, out of these 12,000 examples um, that I got, um, it ended up with about 4,000 examples. So this ratio that we have here, um, <clears throat> uh, 5 out of 12, that's actually sort of roughly the... Um, uh, uh, ratio that, that I would have in, in the beginning. Normally you would just uh, basically whatever program you use to actually query a corpus, uh, you'd export your uh, results to a spreadsheet program, um, which is <clears throat> has the advantage that you can use um, the columns for um, different types of information. So the first uh, few columns in this case would be the metadata. That includes which year does the um, uh, observation come from which period you can sort of have different uh, temporal categories uh, you have your example left exa um, left of context the actual hit in the middle and then your rightward uh, uh, context there and then what's um, usually done in in separate columns is what we call the annotation so you want may want to depending on the phenomenon that you investigate when it nom um, annotate for certain variables. So in this case, and I'm only going to talk about uh, the verb class, I annotated each example, whether it was a false verb, fear verb, and so on and so forth. And I used uh, several other um, variables as well, such as active, is it an active or passive uh, construction, and so on and so forth. So I'll only talk about um, this in the middle uh, here. But that's generally what, what you do, what we mean when we annotate um, our data. And then um, you can do some summary statistics. Okay, so you see that over time, 1810s to the 2000s, the construction increases in frequency. That's how many actual examples we have of that construction in the particular uh, decades. There's a bit of a problem with that, and I'll come to that now, unless there are questions. But, yeah. Yep, first, first very simple um, problem. 
uh, is usually that in, in this corpus in particular, the text material increases over time. So naturally, you'll find more uh, data. So you um, would normalize that by the amount of time. Obviously, if you have five times as much material in the 2000s, then obviously you would have to control for that uh, fact. Okay, so that's what we usually do with... Uh, okay, so there should, it should say here in the, on that scale that is normalized by per million verbs. Okay, so that, that gives us an impression. So this increase is not 20-fold, um, but it is still 5-fold um, over time. So there is an increase if we normalize by a sort of control for the textual um, material. Something that um, we'll do later, we won't talk about the, the decades, but we'll talk about periods. Um, so I binned the data, because it's actually really rare, especially in the early days, we binned the data into um, uh, larger, larger bins, so to speak, um, using a method that um, groups together uh, decades that kind of behave the same way. So you can see like these first few decades behave, um, and then you have a sharp increase, a first sharp increase, and then you have a second increase here um, that allows us to um, sort of tease apart a bit um, the information. Okay, so one of the questions here um, was that, or explanations of why this increased so much over time, is that the construction became more neutral. Okay, that's one suggestion. Um, another suggestion was that the construction um, became more productive. Okay, it allowed more verbs in um, in its slot. Now that's true, um, especially in the period three. That's sort of the 1910s to the 1940s. Um, about here, we have so many new verbs, very creative, a um, lot of hypaxis that only occur once in the construction. Um, so over time that increases. Now the problem, there's an associated problem with corpus size um, as well. So we have <clears throat> a bit of excursion. So even though we have normalized by per million verbs to account for an increasing size of the corpus, there's an associated problem with that. Um, so here that's the um, corpus size increase over time. So the corpus continually um, increases in your types of textual uh, material. So I'll take you um, shark fishing. Okay. Suppose you have um, your lake, and these are freshwater sharks. Okay. And I realize that freshwater well, sharks don't swim in freshwater, but anyway, that's beyond the point. You have your sharks there, and uh, you go shark fishing. You may or may not actually get all of them, um, but uh, you kind of get your uh, general um, thing. Now, with an increasing uh, corpus, more textual material, you actually increase your lake. Not only that, your um, larger lake may, may actually have different sources, so multiple sources, so additional sources. Uh, so over time, especially in diachronic data, um, okay, more, there's more people on the planet, they produce more publishing um, strategies change. Uh, so you increase your um, textual basis not only in terms of, of amount but also in terms of, of sources where the different texts actually come from. That's always a problem to um, investigate productivity in a construction. It's even worse for the intercausative because not only is your lake a bit bigger, your construction is more frequent. Um, so your net is much larger. So even though, if you even if you control your um, sharks by size by giving them, well, sort of reducing them, sort of account for the fact that you have a larger tank spaces, it still means a larger fish net means that you will catch more types of fish or more types of sharks. Okay, so there's a natural thing you can't really um, control for that, or you should. So um, what can you do? Well. You want to um, think about the verb types, okay? So you can sort of put your sharks into different um, species, and then group them, and then see how the individual groups develop over time. So how does your shark population develop over time? Um, because you're comparing groups now rather than looking at the individual instance of your shark. Um, that sort of accounts for um, that some verbs might become more frequent, some verbs might actually be invented. Okay, so that um, minimizes the problem. 
um, slightly. So what really what you want to do here in investigating is something using something that is independent as much as possible of the size of your lake and the size of the net. It's not perfect, but it's uh, slightly better. So that's basically um, what I did. I didn't, didn't um, count the individual instances, but I grouped them into um, use that class uh, variable and see uh, to see whether we have any changes um, in in this distribution. Okay, so you may have seen um, in a um, lot of research where um, such or similar categorizations uh, are made and similar, ta you'd seen similar tables. How do you visualize that? Because we are, as humans are very bad in reading um, such tabular data. It's not very intuitive um, to read. So people go um, about to visualize and one very common way of visualizing um, is such um, elements such as this, which is um, um, a bar plot. Okay. Um, it's not, can't really see much because they're all basically increasing. The only thing that does not seem to be increasing um, as much is the, um, uh, the other verbs, the bin category. Um, but then they're all ordered um, alphabetically, communication verbs, they increase, it's a dark bars, fear verbs, yeah, they kind of all increase. It's really difficult to see um, a pattern. Another um, strategy might be to use um, what's called a stacked bar plot. Now, this is independent of frequency now. It sort of plots the proportions within a period, um, more or less precisely the individual columns and how, how many, um, sort of what's the relationship between them. We can see one additional um, inf piece of information is that the trickery verbs, um, they're proportionally more frequent in the early period and they get less frequent, relatively speaking. And um, another type is here the communication verbs. They have the diff they have sort of like the um, reverse uh, development. So they're proportionally underrepresented in earlier periods, but they become proportionally more frequent. Um, in later periods. So we have a bit of a hunch, but again, it's very difficult to compare the other groups and compare them to each other. A final, <clears throat> which is actually probably, um, well, has an additional advantage, but it has also additional disadvantages, would be you'd, you'd see line plots. Okay, um, it's also frequency based, um, it's um, controlled for the corpus size again. Uh, where well, we have the same pattern, the trickery verbs, they increase, that's what we saw in, in this um, diagram, but the rate of increase slows down, whereas for communication verbs, the rate of increase, uh, rate of growth actually becomes uh, larger. So you have a different pattern there. You can see we saw that in this um, diagram already, but again, apart from that, it's very difficult to see additional data. How do they behave towards um, each other? Okay, so the question is now, could we have all the strengths of all these types of information? They're all based on the same data. It's, it's not um, any, any, uh, any different. Could we combine all that into one diagram, including a relationship between one cell in the table to all the other cells? Okay, see how that shifts, how that distribution uh, shifts here. And there is Nessie association plots, and they work on a very simple uh, principle. Um, so I have a bit of an excursion uh, here towards observed versus expected. That sort of takes into account what the distribution is in a table. You're already familiar with that, I um, assume, by um, having heard of something obscure like the chi-square test. Yep, it's a two-by-two two table. Um, for a class that I was teaching in uh, Neuchâtel in uh, methods and statistics, I made my students, or myself, I don't think I made my students uh, do that, um, go outside in the courtyard and record um, whether males and females differ in dark or light hair. Okay, so make them record um, hair color. So I did that for about 20, 25 um, uh, coffee breaks, and I noted them, okay, every time a male walked past, would it have dark hair, uh, light hair, female walks past, light hair, dark hair, sort of made a bit of a thing. Now, the, the question of, obviously is, you don't assume that either of the genders would have 
a preference for, for light hair or dark hair. Um, so that's your null hypothesis. You don't assume that there is a, um, a distribution there that is significant, that differs from expectation. So we um, uh, can determine what would be expected, given that we uh, um, usually have more females in um, philology departments um, rather than males. So we um, have to normalize again by the overall uh, sample size, which we do by um, multiplying the um, column total with the uh, row total and divide that by the sample total. In this case, we're like 12.5. Okay, so that would be like given this distribution between males and females and dark hair and light hair, we would expect this combination, male with dark hair, uh, to occur 12.5 times. And then we can do that for all the other uh, cells. <clears throat> so some of the, the, there would be variation a bit. The question is, how much does the observed value deviate from what we would expect if it was just a random uh, thing? You may uh, remember, you don't have to recall that uh, in total, but you may remember this formula. Um, to arrive at this uh, chi-square value, you do that for each of the cells. You calculate something, um, a measure of how much the observed value and the expected value um, sort of relate to each other. You sum up all these um, numbers in each cell, and that gives you the overall chi-square value. That's below a certain threshold that we assume uh, for statistical significance, and that's what you usually see in papers like, okay, p-value is above a certain threshold, is not significant, which means there is no difference uh, or no correlation between gender and hair um, color, which is what we would expect. Um, now, if you do that 20 times, you actually find one uh, sample where this actually um, produces a significant result that's sort of the law of large numbers, which is exactly what I wanted my students to find out, that you can have, just by pure chance, get a distribution uh, once every 20, 30 times that you do that. Because that is a basic principle, putting into perspective observed and expected, that also works on the association plots. So the first case study, um, we saw that table before, the shifts in uh, verb classes. If you ran a chi-square test on uh, this table, it turns out that this distribution is um, statistically highly significant. Um, but it has a very low uh, effect size, meaning there is not a major shift in, in that distribution, which is what we expect. I mean, there's, we saw that they all increase, they kind of like, you know, have the same relations, but there, there might be some changes. And this indicates is that there is something going on in the data, and the question is, um, what's that. Okay, for, for we do the same thing. We can uh, uh, calculate the expected values for each cell. So for communication in period one, um, it only occurs 17 times where it would have been expected uh, 23 times about, given the conditions in all other cells. So you put them into perspective uh, there. Same for fear. They occur more often than expected, and so on. But again, we have the same um, problem, obviously, that this is very difficult to read. But all that we have to do now is to visualize that in, in a plot. Surprise, exciting. Okay, so in the, in the next plot, what we will see is each combination of a verb class with a, uh, a period. If um, a tile, I'm going to show you tiles, if a tile is dark blue, it means that combination occurs more often than expected, and the redder it is, the more underrepresented something is. Okay, so what does this uh, show? Um, it shows, like I said, several pieces of information in one go. So at the at first glance, they're a bit difficult to interpret, uh, but once you know what to look for, um, they're actually relatively straightforward. So the tile width represents how wide a tile is, represents how frequent something is. Okay, that explains why the first period is actually rather uh, skinny. And then towards the end, you have uh, more data, the tiles become uh, wider. So there's your frequency uh, line plot. Um, it also um, shows the color. Like I said, the redder it is, the more underrepresented it is for a particular period. And the darker it is, uh, sorry, the, the dark blue it is, the more overrepresented it is. And then you have also like different color depths um, as well. If it's gray, kind of come back to that in a, 
in a second. Now, what do we see? Not much. Okay, we see, uh, again, we had that before, communication verbs are underrepresented in earlier periods and they're overrepresented in later periods. And we have the trickery verbs um, that are overrepresented in earlier periods but underrepresented in later periods. But the cool thing is now, now that you have um, sort of a statistical measure, you can reorder them by that statistical uh, measure. And I did that um, by the um, cell numbers in uh, the first period. Okay, so if you've rearranged them, you have um, in the first three lines, or we'll focus on the first two lines, you have the trickery and the fear verbs that are overrepresented in earlier periods, and you have the false and the communication verbs that are underrepresented in earlier periods, and then vice versa. So what the associ association plot ideally does, it shows you a temporal or diachronic progression from uh, left to right. Okay, over, over. Okay, so here's a bit of a progression there. And ideally, depending on the order of the rows, it also gives you a qualitative progression from trickery and fear to force and communication verbs. The question now is, what does that tell us really? Is that a pattern that is just, I mean, this order, is it random or is there something linguistically uh, going on? Okay, so we know that this overall distributional change is statistically significant, but it, is it also linguistically um, interesting? And actually, if you go by the um, theoretical construction perspective, this is precisely the pattern that we would expect. Why? Oh, yeah, uh, just briefly, um, that's the bar plot we had in the beginning where we couldn't read anything because it's kind of messy. But if you rearrange that by um, the same order that we have in the association plot, we kind of get the same picture. Um, is that the uh, uh, trickery and fear verbs, they have this kind of slowing down rate of growth, whereas the force and the communication verb have a bit of an increasing pattern of growth. Okay. Right, now on to why is that um, exactly what we expect? So if we go back to the meaning of the construction, cause um, or causa acts on a causee to carry out a result. Um, If you look at the trickery and fear verbs, they are more compatible with a cause and effect relationship um, between a man and a woman, or a woman and a man, right? If you have, if you betray someone, if you scare someone, if you um, cause some unpleasant feeling in some person, that has an implied effect towards um, uh, action. So these verbs are, are actually fully compatible with that meaning. On the other hand, if you look at the communication verbs, which are underrepresented in earlier uh, periods, you do not have that implied effect because usually communication verbs um, are sort of a reciprocal relationship between uh, two people, so they're not as compatible potentially um, as the, the uh, trickery and fear verbs. So that would, would be expected to have, to have them underrepresented in earlier times, whereas we'd have them um, up here and come back to that in, in a second. Now, the, something that was a bit odd, that I thought was a bit funny, is the false verbs. Why wouldn't the false verbs be compatible? Because if you force someone to do something, obviously you'd, you'd have a cause and effect uh, relationship. So they should be compatible, but they're not. But if you look at um, what force and, or, well, force is one of the f most frequent verbs in, in uh, this category, in the construction, you think like, okay, so maybe it's incompatible with the construction because it has a different argument structure profile for someone to do something, or it is semantically incompatible. And this is precisely what happens. If you look at the 19th century um, uses of the verse force, that verb isn't used to force people to do something, but it's actually used 
force a tear, force a discussion, force a door open. Okay, so that is incompatible with um, this um, uh, constructional meaning or what we think is a constructional meaning. Similarly, uh, torture, you torture one's mind, you torture one's feelings, but you don't really torture people. So what we think today that the meaning of this verb is doesn't necessarily have to be the case uh, diachronically. Okay, so force and torture do occur in earlier periods and throughout um, the construction's history, but their different meaning and the different argument structure profile affects the likelihood of that, which means, which explains why they're underrepresented in earlier times, but then, are, relatively speaking, uh, more frequent in, in later uh, periods, which kind of come back to that in in the conclusion, which kind of suggests that the construction became more tolerant over time to include incompatible uh, verbs. Okay, so th this is just by the um, uh, verb classes, and the hunch that we have with force, maybe that there is something going on about compatibility, how do verbs usually occur in which argument structure construction? So think back about talk, where we can't say talk somebody, Right? So maybe that's the, the um, development that we also see here is that um, initially it favors semantically compatible verbs. So the hypothesis is that the construction initially also um, favored compatible argument structure. Okay, verbs that usually occur in, in uh, relative, relevant argument structures. So that's the um, second uh, case study. Um, for which I use, and it's kind of a bit complicated, So, but if you understand the general principle, um, should be fine. I did that in various um, uh, shapes and sizes, and I'm reporting um, the results for 200 random observations per period of verbs in that period, but outside the intercausative. What do I mean? Okay, here are your um, periods. So for the first period, I um, uh, suppose you have in the first periods verbs A, C, uh, A B, and C. I queried the verbs that occur in the intercausative, um, A, B, and C, in that period, in the corpus, and then took 200 random observations. For the second period, there may be um, additional verbs, and some verbs may fall out of use. So you may have um, A, B, D, and E verbs. And again, I queried these verbs in that particular period, and then took 200 random uh, examples, and so on and so forth. Now, with the final set of 800 observations, 200 per period, I um, only took those observations that are not the intercausative, and I annotated them by um, the animacy of the patient. Okay, so animate patient, for instance, frightened. Uh, may have had an example who frightened him. Okay, that's an animate patient. They bullied everyone. Um, the inanimate patient examples would be we argue a case or they ridicule authority. And finally, you can have use of these verbs that normally or that can occur in the intercausative but that are usually um, intransitive. She talks uh, to him, okay, so I included the uh, complex intransitives in, in that category, or they laugh. Okay, so laugh is a typical intransitive uh, verb that you'd also find in the intercausative. They laughed him into leaving the stage or they laughed him, her, into giving up whatever you want to give up, okay? Now, what's the expectation? Well, if we um, assume that the construction initially favored verbs that have a compatible argument structure, then we would expect that um, animate um, patients or, uh, would be overrepresented and that these two um, lower groups would be underrepresented because they are, are usually by their argument structure profiles incompatible um, with the construction. And that's precisely uh, what we find. Uh, okay, so initially uh, the verbs that occurred in the intercausative were transitive verbs outside the intercausative with an animate uh, subject, and vice versa for um, the, um, the rest of these. So these may have been um, incompatible to be used in the construction, but they come, become relatively more frequent um, over time.
Poo. It's a mouthful. Okay. General principle, but uh, yeah. So what happens here? I um, when I looked at that, I think well, that's and then a miracle occurs. Uh, you familiar with this cartoon? <laughs> Complex formula, and uh, and then says then a miracle occurs, and then someone said I think you should be more explicit here in step two. <laughs> now, can we be more specific in uh, step two? Not really. Okay, there's no there's nothing miraculously that occurs. I mean, this is kind of a mathematical um, situation. If you have something overrepresented there, you must have something. You know, <clears throat> sorry, the reverse order somewhere, and this must change at some point. Uh, sometimes these uh, miracle periods um, are a bit clearer, so that's a very clear example. We, the one that we had before wasn't as clear, but there will be a changeover at some point. But how do we um, interpret um, this, this change of a period? Even though it is a mathematical certainty, can we interpret that the major change in the construction happened in that period? No, we can't. So we have to be very careful of how we interpret that, um, that changeover. What we can, however, I think, is compare the different um, patterns that we find. So the, um, just to recall that was the argument structure um, plot, and that was the semantic classes that we saw before. Now, if we compare them to each other, okay, I'm blanking out the first period and the last period because they show the same pattern, then they differ in their patterns in the, in the middle part. Okay, So for the first, uh, with the semantic classes, the miracle occurs period would be here probably because that's where they change um, direction, so to speak. <coughs> Whereas for the argument structure um, pattern outside the intercausative, um, the change of it seems to here a bit before the other change. So that could give you an idea of, and so if you're still looking for a, um, a BA, MA topic, um, that could actually give rise to something that you can investigate. Is the structural change, does that come before the semantic change? Okay, so uh, how I would interpret it, this picture would give rise to a new testable hypothesis, is that um, the change occurs first within a class, okay, so the, the construction likely spreads to uh, semantically similar verbs that have different argument structure profiles before it spreads uh, to more or sort of more incompatibly, semantically incompatible uh, verbs. So that could be a hypothesis um, that could be investigated. The last type um, Problem in interpretation uh, pertains to the fact, what, what we had before, is this period, that's the 1910s to the 1940s, is that a period of changeover or is it something else? That you can't read from an association plot. Um, this is data from 200 years, 1810s to the 2000s. If you restrict your data to the 1910s to the 1930s, so that's only one century you find more or less the same pattern, okay? So the trickery verbs um, that in the 200 year period are overrepresented only in the 18th century, but more or less underrepresented in much of the 20th century, that you don't, you don't see here. So if you restrict your data, your window of attention, so to speak, so if you only look at a subset of the data, you find it's still the same pattern in the early um, 20th century the triggering fear verbs are still relatively overrepresented um, as opposed to the force and the communication verbs. Okay, so all that tells us, like, you can't say when the change happened. The only interpretation you're left with is that the change is gradual um, over time and that it's not tied to a specific period. Conversely, if we had data from the 1680s, where we first find the construction, up until now, that pattern would look very much the same, or that at least that's the, um, the whether that would be the um, expectation. So you have to be very careful, of course, in interpreting or not reading too much into um, the construction or into into your data. 
but it gives you a good idea of what's actually happening um, in, in a sort of a diachronic progression from uh, the early periods of your time frame that you have to the later period, as well as in qualitative terms. How does the construction change um, within uh, itself? Okay, that will leave me to a uh, final few words um, that sort of tries to link back to um, the theory. Uh, so if you want to go into diachronic change, there's a, a major debate at the moment in how to account for um, constructional change um, in that way, and I may have some um, ideas there. Okay, so we started off with this synchronic um, realization that we have a pattern that is a cue for co um, causative meaning. We also know that it increased over frequent, in frequency over time, um, but that is very difficult to measure in terms of productivity or creativity. Uh, so it's very difficult um, methodological problems. Um, <coughs> we usually go about by approaching it, sort of looking into, into your data. Do we see patterns um, in that progression? Where I suggest that the association plots are actually um, a pretty awesome thing because you can reorder them based on the data. That wouldn't have been possible with these plots. Okay, so these, the gray plots, um, they're either ordered by um, the frequency of something in some period or alphabetically or something else. But sometimes even things that are very infrequent tend to have a very um, large impact on, um, on changes. And that's actually what this plot takes into account as well. So here you connect, you, you see change in infrequent um, categories as well, uh, not just the most frequent ones. So that sort of puts things more into perspective by putting it sort of into the larger, larger picture of that, um, of that table. Okay, that would be enough. That's a very decent um, descriptive um, analysis of the history of the um, intercausative. If you want to go back to the theoretical um, question where uh, we see from a synchronic construction grammar perspective, uh, assume that the structural pattern, independent of what occurs in its, um, in its slots, is a cue for uh, causative uh, meaning. I would argue that this is, this cue of causation increases over time. Or if you want to have it in construction grammar um, uh, words, is that the links between uh, the semantics and syntax grow stronger over time? Okay, that's that's a bit of that's an, a construction internal um, change where we saw that the construction over time becomes more tolerant towards incompatible semantic verb classes and incompatible verbs by their structural uh, profiles. But we also saw that this is um, not, a, it's kind of very, like, very small step, very gradual uh, process, okay? So depending on what your size, the size of your window is, you can't say when it became from here to here. This is a, a gradual um, increase of um, link strength, so to speak. Wow, that was construction grammar, association plots, intercausative, and corpus linguistics in under an hour. You should congratulate yourself. Thank you. Do you have any questions or comments? Towards the beginning, you discussed about some monitors to play that those ones that would not be interpositive. Would have been also interesting to see them like the relation, the intercognitive yeah, um, obviously not all of them are the same type of non-example, okay? Uh, so obviously all the examples that include something, everything, or something go away into everlasting punishment. I mean, they're clearly not the construction. What's more difficult, um, and various authors have very differing opinions, is the, the status of something like uh, call it into being. God calls X or us into being. Um, I excluded them. Um, 
others have included them, so I mean, I excluded them, put them in a category maybe. And I looked at that and, and uh, they become relatively less frequent uh, with the construction. So, but that also may have something to do not with constructional change, but more with the type of text spaces, because you have like call someone into being, that's a very religious um, phrase. And over time, religious texts become proportionally less frequent in, in corpora. So that may just be something that is based on the publication um, culture. Um, they, they kind of fit, if, if you think back to where, the, where I think the construction came from, um, call something into being is ambiguous between the nominal um, and the a verbal uh, reading. So I chose to exclude them entirely. So if, it, if it's the existence sense um, that, is, uh, that was excluded, uh, but there is clearly a relationship. Um, similar with I'm moving the army into France. I mean, that's still today, that's the, the, the ordinary course motion construction is very um, still relevant and connected to, uh, to that. So they, 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 that would be something, um, that's a whole new research project. That's a PhD maybe that you want to <laughs> investigate these relationships uh, more closely. I mean, there's lots to, to explore. But yeah, um, true, there's diff different um, types of what's an example and what's not. On one hand, just a comment, I really find this idea very intriguing to say that the construction becomes more tolerant, basically, this idea of widening the, the possible verbs that can go into that, because I think we see that in a number of constructions and their changes, so that they, they actually become more tolerant. I think that's really something worth investigating in greater detail, this kind of idea. Either of narrowing down that certain constructions become less tolerant, and others wider. So that's just as a comment, I think that's very intriguing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in, 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 this, in this case, I'd be super surprised. I mean, okay, so in, in, in the article um, that this talk is based on, it was actually two articles, but um, initially they thought, okay, the construction widens in functional scope. So every time a construction becomes more frequent, people say like, oh, it must have acquired new functions, it spreads to new um, verb classes, uh, ext it's a semantic extension. Mm -hmm argument where I say, well, actually, I argue the exact opposite, um, saying that the construction became more restrictive, um, but that this restriction makes it more tolerant towards, towards um, other things, because the structure itself is um, the cue for causative meaning. Um, so that would be, um, hmm, with constructions becoming is that what you meant with the construction becoming more yeah, yeah, yeah. restrictive? Yeah, yeah. So that, I think that's that's basically just a different perspective on how we account for yeah. frequency increases. The question, though, is the the or oh, um, if an increasing frequency doesn't necessarily have to occur. So we could actually be, it's quite conceivable to see all these changes in a construction that is still extremely rare. Um, over time that never that didn't increase fivefold in, in frequency we could see the same pattern uh, so these are not causally um, related but obviously that was the first point of entry saying like okay what 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 really happened um, but I'm just saying but assuming that basically um, this greater tolerance of the construction towards new f verbs also means that it's more accessible in other situational contexts Therefore, it's, it occurs in more situational text types. Therefore, you find more verbs in your corpus. Um, so that's always a bit difficult to separate the wheat from the chaff. Okay, how much of that is <coughs> purely based on your on your textual basis? Uh, because also, what um, um, the productivity? I think that um, Florent Perec has done a lot of work on syntactic productivity over time. Um, where he has to deal with exactly these problems, but he has several subtypes of a construction, so he can control for different textual bases um, uh, there where I, I can't really. I mean, there's, there's not, I mean, I could probably force an interpretation. There are several subsenses of the um, intercausative, what Anatoly Stefanovic had done with, um, uh, with several subtypes of, of causation. 
Um, so that might be uh, something, something to. Yeah, it, it would be really interesting um, to see, to look at the patterns that this would take in, uh, in British English. Um, there is a slight difference between how British English uses the construction and has, has, how it is used in American English today. So this is a slight, it's very tiny, but there's a slight difference is that I think the Brits are more brutal and the Americans are more persuasive. Uh, it's, an, um, uh, it's an article by Wolf and colleagues. Um, the problem is a text base. Um, there is no available corpus, as, at least to my knowledge, that have the same um, you, you need a lot of data for that construction. It's quite complex. It's pretty rare. Um, for British English, it's, I think, for the, in the historical part, it's very difficult. So the few examples that I have from the um, uh, 19th century come from a corpus that is only 30 million rather than 400 million. Um, so to make, the, to make that kind of analysis is very, very difficult. We can do that for um, synchronic data. There's lots of web data. Um, but obviously, then we couldn't have the temporal uh, progression. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that, that's that's really that's really unfortunate. Um, you can sort of simulate um, variation in uh, the 20th century, and some people have done that um, for different corpora. So there's a cohort corpus, which is sort of a broad corpus, has like. Um, uh, fiction, non-fiction, um, news, and so on. And there's the Times Magazine corpus, which uses newspaper language only. And that's what you can use sort of to compare the dif differences between uh, between genre, perhaps. Uh, but I think that the, ver the different varieties of English approach would be quite um, interesting. And uh, yeah, so if, if there's no uh, diachronic corpus for uh, British English, um, in sufficient uh, amounts of, of data, then it's very difficult to find, um, like you know, other interesting uh, patterns in New World um, English, as Indian English, or Caribbean English. So that's uh, that's a bit unfortunate, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, welcome on thin ice. Yeah, that's very difficult, actually. Um, there are some, uh, okay, categorization is very subjective. Um, you have some, just, a, you know, you, you're plain vanilla prototype theory. You have clear examples um, that are illustrated for each of the categories. And then it's very difficult um, to, for others to actually put them into, into either. I, for the doubtful cases, I had two categories, and I ran the analysis sort of like putting them, okay, does it really change if I put some in this class and some in this class? Um, and it's not, the pattern actually is relatively stable, because usually the, uh, the verbs that, that are very difficult to classify, usually between um, the, the, the trickery and the fear verbs, that's sort of, that's very, very diff difficult. But those that are difficult to classify, they tend to be the very infrequent ones. So they, they may actually be um, the number of types that you try to classify out of the 400 types that I had for this data set. Uh, it might be very difficult to classify 100. But these 100 lemmas are very infrequent. They only account for like 5% of the data. So all the plots that I showed, um, uh, they were based on tokens, not on types. Um, okay, so that's the plot you saw before. That's based on tokens, and that's on types. Now, there are fewer colored in um, tiles, but the pattern overall is actually more or less identical. That the, we have fewer colors in there because the data, there's only... Um, well, there's 400 data points in this, and there's 4,000 data points in that, so the picture is less clear. But, um, yeah, you see the blue ones here for trickery and fear, and the red ones here for um, force and, and other verbs. So, um, 
maybe we'd have, to have time for that later. There's actually an interesting pattern here um, that is relatively straightforward for all the major classes, but uh, the misc verbs, these are the only ones where this actually changes. Um, so that we could go into detail, but um, to answer your question, yes, it's very difficult to, to classify. But yeah, keep in mind that sometimes uh, reclassification, um, you should always do that. Um, but if it doesn't lead to significantly other uh, problems, the pattern remains the same, then that, that sort of counterbalances a bit of the subjectivity um, that you may have. Yeah. Probably this that in your book. Um, of course, you have these alternative constructions, and I really wonder how they relate. In particular, I'm thinking about stuff like the one slide you have. They terrorized him into doing this or that. They terrorized him to do this or that. They forced yeah. him into. They forced him to do that. They look pretty synonymous. Um, they are probably not. But have you any thoughts on that? Um. Yeah, that's uh, okay. What, what is that? Um, okay, so force, uh, for instance. Um, I mean, we we sort of has a major <coughs> sort of leaning or skew towards force somebody to do something. Mm -hmm. um, they're not synonymous in the sense that um, causation is actually inherent in the intercausative. Um, so forcing someone into marrying another person implies that the marriage has actually been taken place, has taken place, that it's been carried out. Uh, whereas with the two pattern, that's not necessarily the case. So you may actually have verbs in force someone to marry someone that kind of implies that marriage would have taken, but um, persuade someone to marry someone doesn't really have that implication. So with the with the two pattern, it seems that the causation is more a fact of the, uh, more a matter of the verb that occurs in it rather than the, the, the structural pattern. Um, so that's something um, that is more verb specific. So I try to incorporate that precisely how does that um, relate to each other and the sample with the um, argument structure profiles outside the construction was a bit of a, a step towards that direction. Uh, because otherwise it's very difficult because you'd have to get argument structure profiles for 400 verbs, um, which I think you should take about at least 25 per period or per, per decade. Um, and that gets really difficult at some point of how to corporate it, which is why I d did that sample. So the sample I reported here was just a, an unbalanced uh, sample. I did another um, sample which was fully balanced um, and that was so complicated that I thought, okay, well, I'm not going into that. The patterns are actually almost identical. Um, at least interpretation is identical. That I thought I'd report the unbalanced sample, which is kind of complicated enough already. So, um, but but yeah, that's something I'm looking into in um, in the synchronic part of the intercausative because what's interesting, you have some verbs. Like talk, okay, so talk is the most frequent verb in the construction, um, but very atypical verb by the, the argument patterns it usually occurs in. So that's one thing we talked about. The other thing is that um, what you would think is near synonymous is totally not, doesn't occur in the construction, uh, which is speak. Okay, you don't speak someone into doing something. Now that's, that's pretty strange. Why... Um, Okay, so we said like, one constraint on the construction is that you have these verb classes that have uh, imply a cause-effect relationship, but that have weird um, argument structure profiles. And then, but even within that class, not everything is possible. And the question is why? Um, I suspect speak has a sort of the, the profile, like speaking uh, profiles more the act, the action of speaking. Whereas talk profiles the connection between two people or the reciprocity uh, between two people, but that's something um, I mean hot topic really uh, in construction grammar in general. Why why is that so constrained um, in that, and why do uh, for that matter um, no causative verb occur in that construction? Cause make get. Well, there's a couple of examples of get in in, uh, but they're pretty rare. Um, yeah, why do you not find them? In there. Why do you not find 
as a general rule, motion verbs. I mean, if, it, if we have a metaphorical motion thing. Uh, so that's two, two aspects that I uh, could look into. Uh, and yeah, we've been thinking about um, doing um, argument structure profiles um, sort of semi-automatically because that's like, otherwise it's just really difficult. Um, Thank you.